right, so when you're ready, let's get going. Sounds good. Hi, I'm Tobias Carlyle. This is the Acquirers Podcast. My special guest today is my old friend, Alex Rubel Carver. He's a value investor turned seed stage venture angel investor. His firm is Stage Venture Partners. I'll be talking to him right after this. Tobias Carlyle is the founder and principal of Acquirers Funds. For regulatory reasons, we will not discuss any of the acquirer's funds on this podcast. All opinions expressed by podcast participants are solely their own and do not reflect the opinions of acquirer's funds or affiliates. For more information, visit acquirersfunds.com. Hi, Alex. How are you? I'm well, Toby. Glad to be here. So you're one of the folks I've known in the States for the longest, you, Chris Cole, and a handful of guys. You, know, you also know Chris, funnily enough, Small World. Yeah, I haven't seen Chris in a long time, but he's off doing really exciting things. So uh, tell us a little bit about Stage. What do you do there? So my firm is a seed venture capital firm that invests in enterprise software startups. What that means is that we're typically coming into a company when they're four or five or maybe six or seven people. They're about a year or two old. Um, They're raising anywhere from one to three million dollars in their first institutional round of capital. Right. So let's let's talk about enterprise software. What what is enterprise software? So enterprise software can mean a bunch of different things. It can mean developer tools, things like Atlassian or uh, Stripe or stuff like that. It can mean network and telecom and data center related products, something like a pager duty, um, or it can represent an application layer product like a Salesforce. I tend to play at the top of the stack. I tend to invest almost entirely in application layer products or middleware. Um, And what that means is that I'm typically investing in high-end expensive software that is used by business users with business uh, customers within a specific vertical. And what's the reason for targeting that part of the stack? I target that part of the stack because if you're investing in more horizontal type products, think about something like a, a Zoom or a Slack. At the seed stage, it's very difficult to tell who's got any kind of product differentiation. It's very difficult to tell how you're going to figure out customer acquisition. And it's immensely competitive. You know, once you sort of figure out that Zoom is better than anything else, then the challenge becomes, how do you make sure you get in the series B or C or D round of that company? And there's intense competition to do that. Whereas if a startup comes out with better software or an entirely new class of software to do something in clinical trials for pharmaceuticals, you know you have a pretty tight group of customers that you're targeting. You know you have a pretty compelling and easy to articulate value proposition and you know that there are not going to be a thousand startups competing against you because you need very serious domain expertise to be a credible founder in a market like that so are you looking at when you say vertical enterprise that's something similar to uh like constellations famously looking for vertical market software is it a similar uh direction yeah somewhat you know constellation is typically buying up legacy products that may not have gotten super large, but that are companies that serve their customers really effectively and that have a long uh, basis for renewals. I'm looking for things that have all of that, but that also have the potential to scale from zero or close to zero in revenues at the time that I invest to hundreds of millions of dollars of annual recurring revenue or more within 10 years. Right. Um, and. What's the what's the expectation of these companies? That you, you, what's your expectation for the hit rate at, at that stage? To a certain extent, the hit rate doesn't matter. And it's a funny thing to, to say, but portfolio management in venture is more about how big your biggest three winners in a portfolio of 20 or 25 companies are than it is about what percentage of investments that you make money on. You know, whether, if I make one or two or three X my money on a startup, that's a nice thing, but that also doesn't really move the needle for my portfolio. What moves the needle is how big are my three biggest winners going to be. If my three biggest winners are you know, 25x, 12x, and 8x, my fund is going to be pretty mediocre because I'm going to have a bunch of zeros. 
in the portfolio in addition to those winners. I need my biggest winners to hopefully be somewhere around 100x in order to generate returns that compensate my investors for taking a risk on an asset class as illiquid and as uh, risky as seed stage venture. So given that you have this long right tail of returns, how then do you go about constructing a portfolio? So you construct a portfolio from a few different ways. Number one, you have to think about what's your valuation when you're getting in, what percentage ownership of a company you're buying, uh, number two. Number three, you have to be thinking about how much money do you put in upfront and how much do you reserve for follow on and then where and how do you deploy your follow on reserves. Everyone wants to use their follow ons for pro rata when you have a company that you did the seed round in and then the Series A is led by Kleiner Perkins or Sequoia and you have all of the social validation that comes with that. But that will happen some of the time. Some of the time you'll also need to deploy your reserves to help a company where it took a little bit longer to get to product market fit than you had hoped and you need to give them another six months of runway in order to get there. Sometimes you need to use your reserves to bridge a company through a downturn. Um, you know, downturns do come from time to time. It's been a while, uh, but uh, but we will have those. Sometimes you need to think about using your reserves in other ways. And so portfolio management for venture is largely a question of reserve management. And it's very different from public market investing where you get to visit and revisit that decision every single day where you have a high degree of reversibility um, and you have the liquidity that's available in anything other than the most liquid micro caps to make high resolution decisions. Decisions in venture are largely irreversible. They are um, very low resolution in the sense that you only get a few chances to do it and often the decisions are binary and have a social pressure that come along with them. And they're infrequent and unpredictable. Let's just uh, back up a little bit and talk about what what are reserves and what do you mean by follow on. So, and let, let me just uh, ask a little bit more detail. When you sure. when you're making your initial investment, you're assuming that there will be some follow on or some reserve investment. So, what portion of your in, of your anticipated total investment are you making at, at that first stage? So at the first stage, I'm probably putting somewhere between 35 and 50% of the total amount of money that I expect to invest into that company to work. And I'm holding back the rest of it to invest in the company at some later time. And you do that for a few reasons. You do that because you want to maintain your ownership when a company raises future capital and you can use your right to invest in that round. That's called your pro rata rights. Um, you also use it because you get more information as you go farther along in time. You know, when, when I'm investing in a company that is, I mean, the, the youngest company I have ever, I've ever invested in, I met when they were three weeks post incorporation, and that was a team of four people. They had a logo and a deck, and you know, some early customers that they were talking to, but there was very little information there. Um, so when I'm looking when I'm looking at a company like that, a year, a year and a half, or two years from now, when the next round comes up, I'm going to know a lot more about how well they went about the big things that a startup has to do. How well did they hire? How well did they ship product, and how quickly and, and efficiently did they ship product? Um, did pricing come in on the software anywhere near what we expected it to? What did customer acquisition look like? All of these questions, I'm going to have far more answers to and far more information about in the next round. And so usually that means I probably am paying a higher price per share for those shares, but the upside is still so large that it's a good decision to hold back some amount. How much you hold back is one of these questions that there's endless debate about in venture. And, you know, VCs go back and forth on blog posts and on Twitter, you know, debating this kind of stuff endlessly. What's, what's your ideal target look like? In terms of what? In terms of characteristics of the company or return characteristics? Or? Yeah, in terms, of, in terms of the characteristics of the company, what are you looking for when you're, when you're first making these investments? What stage should they be at? What should they have done? So some of the companies I invest in are pre-revenue and pre-product. 
when I invest in a company that has not yet shipped a product and generated revenue, I am typically looking for a team that has substantial domain experience. I'm looking for customers who have said in writing that as soon as this product is ready, we're going to use it and we're going to spend you know, money on it within a reasonable bound that uh, that is up for negotiation, that are willing to get on the phone and talk with me to verify that. Um, and I'm looking for some sense that the market is big enough to support the return expectations that I have uh, for my fund. When a company is in revenue um, and has some early customers that I want to be able to talk to those customers, understand why they're using it, I want to look at you know, how those customers were acquired and whether that says anything about how, you know, we will be able to acquire customers going forward. You know, a lot of startups acquire the first customers from their relationships, and that's fine. But, you know, if your first customer is your father-in-law's company, you know, I need to know how you're going to get beyond your father-in-law's company. Uh, do you have any preference for very big ticket items and, and fewer of them or lots of smaller uh lots of smaller investments is there any is there any guideline for which of those is a better investment opportunity i in terms of like the price of the software that right. we're talking about or the size of the investments i'm right? asking you if uh 100 duck sized horses will defeat one horse sized duck <laughs> um i tend to be moderately concentrated in terms of investments so per fund i'm going to make 20 to 25 investments in my fund two, which I have fully deployed, I, I deployed into 20 companies. Um, in my current fund three, I'm planning on about 25. And then when it comes to the question of, you know, who these folks are selling to, my portfolio companies are tending to sell software that is pretty expensive, that solves very critical business needs, and as a result, is not software that's selling for, you know, 9.95 per month. It's often software that is, Ten to fifty thousand dollars for point software, and then for systems of record or core systems of engagement, it's software at a hundred thousand dollars plus per year. So let's just take a step back. You started out as a value investor, and you've transitioned across to venture. What uh, what prompted the transition? I actually started as a VC, and then went back into then went into public market investing, and then came back to VC. So my first job out of college was as an analyst at Anthem Venture Partners in Santa Monica, where I worked for just under three years. Um, that firm is now the second oldest continuously active venture firm in LA. Um, there are now over 200 venture firms in LA, but, uh, but Anthem is uh, one of the granddaddies of them. And while I was there, we were Series A investors in companies like TrueCar, MySpace, and Android. Uh, all of which were deals that I supported the partners on as an analyst. And um, we were also investors in tons of chip and semiconductor companies that nobody outside the semiconductor industry would know. Um, after that, I uh, transitioned to running a long-oriented uh, fund focused on special situations in public markets. Did that for a number of years. And then along the way, I would do an occasional angel investment. I didn't do a huge amount. I did you know, seven or eight, you can count them on your hands. Um, but I've only lost money on one of those. I have ones that's still active and all the others had substantial exits. And I was looking at that track record and those exits that were coming seven or eight years ago. And I could feel at the same time, the diminution in alpha around value oriented strategies in the markets that all of us have experienced. And I said, you know, I think there's there's something interesting happening there. I think there, there is something, the universe is trying to tell me something that I'm probably better at this venture stuff uh, and that I should be orienting my career in that direction. And so I flipped back. I started Stage in 2015 and uh, have been running it ever since. And what skills do you take across from value to venture? Yeah, there's, there's a few, you know, both value investing and venture capital are disciplines that are built around fundamental analysis. You know, we are business analysts studying competitive advantage and capital efficiency and returns on invested capital. Um, whether we are looking for high quality mispriced 
businesses on the public markets or whether we are looking at nascent startups. We're also patient long-term investors. You know, when I write a check to a startup, I have no expectation of getting a return on that investment for six or eight or 10 years. It takes that long to go from three guys and a dog in a WeWork to ringing the bell on the NASDAQ at your IPO. You know, that, that, is, that is not something that can be rushed. And so the time orientation that value investors tend to have lines up really well with the, with the time orientation that VCs have to have. Uh, you've written some interesting blog posts on the site. I, I, the, the most one, of, the, the first one I want to discuss is the trillion dollar company idea. Yes. So let's let's talk about that. What's what's the what's the thesis of the blog post? And then I've got some questions for you. The thesis of the blog post is that we now have um, a handful of public companies in the United States: Apple, Microsoft, Google, and Amazon. Uh, in addition to dozens of other companies that are almost as big as them that are so big that I think that they have escaped regulation from their investors, from the regulatory bodies in this country, and from consumers. And that we have this issue where there's a fundamental mismatch between the ability of people to exercise any kind of government governance or accountability on companies of this size. You know. When you think about a trillion dollar company and you think about the fact that the largest activist hedge fund in the world has what 30 or 40 billion dollars in assets under management so Who's they that could now? Put Elliot? someone like that yeah and so they could put one percent you know if they bought three or four billion dollars worth of a trillion dollar company they would have a one percent one and a half two percent position and i don't think you can rattle sabers with with that little power and there's no one now who can who can exercise governance over companies of that scale yeah you made the point in the in the blog post that the biggest pe fund has about 26 billion biggest activist funds say 40 billion they can't dedicate the entire fund to one position so they have to right. that maybe they can get 25 percent of the fund into one position or that would be pretty concentrated that's 10 billion dollars for the activist fund into right uh into a trillion dollar company that just, it doesn't, there's no influence at that level. So what's the solution to that? Do we need to regulate them more or what, what, do we, what happens? Do we need bigger, bigger activist funds? I think ultimately we're gonna to have to have activism go hand in hand with passive ownership of public companies because that's where all the ownership lies. That's where the capital is going. And it has been anathema to the co corporate culture of large passive owners of public equities to exercise any kind of influence or activism on their holdings. But there's nothing that says that that has to be the case. You could have a passive ETF oriented manager that exercises very strong activism and accountability on their underlying public companies, even if they're invested in thousands of them. Uh, and I think something like that has to happen. How that works, how you pay for that on you know, a few bips of management fees is, is a really interesting question. And I don't have a good, I don't have a good answer for that. You know, more far, you know far more about that world than I do. Well, CalPERS, of course, was always willing to support activists, but it's been Index funds have largely been uh, passive, as the as the name suggests. But then, it looked like there might be some moves on the ESG front by firms. Like I think it's BlackRock that has come out and said they'll move on environmental issues. Do you think that that extends perhaps to, to governance as well? I, I think it's a start. Um, you know, I'm hesitant to ascribe any anything resembling strategy to announcements out of Calpers. Uh, they're they're, uh, they're blown in the wind uh, pretty easily, and uh, and so I'm not uh, I'm not looking expectantly at Sacramento as a savior here. What what about from a policy prescription? Is there do we need to bust these companies up through antitrust or something like that? I guess, I guess the challenge is so many of these companies have not grown through antitrust. Um, you know, a few of them have an excellent. Um, 
track record in m a you know google's acquisitions in the middle part of last decade from android itself uh which you know my prior firm was involved with to youtube and double click and a few others uh, applied semantics here in southern california that, that's a hell of a track record uh but no no acquisition they have made recently has or will move the needle as much as those did and google was not perceived as a threat on an antitrust level today in the or back then in the way that they are today you, you don't necessarily need to stop it at the acquisition stage so there's certainly precedent for those things being busted up like the the uh, ma bell and the baby bells uh and you know there's a there's an argument to me that google has a sort of stranglehold on many different industries so, so travel ota travel has that's the uh, travel companies that sell over the internet have encountered yep. the issue where you have Google coming in and now sells a competing uh, flight travel service. So I just, I just wonder if that inspires them to do something. It could. Um, and certainly Google making any attempt on a transformative and anti-competitive acquisition today would be met with a lot of skepticism that would prevent something like that. But most of the deals that they made that put them in a position that they are today were done over a decade ago when nobody perceived them to be as dangerous as they perceive them to be now. Yeah, I remember that YouTube acquisition, a billion dollars seemed outrageous at the time. It's probably outrageously cheap in retrospect. Yeah, when uh, when he was asked about that, Eric Schmidt uh, said at the time, I will have either wildly overpaid or wildly underpaid. <laughs> Don't know which. And and he was right about that. Uh, next blog post, you discuss what do you fear? I mean, aside from like great white sharks and uh, spiders, what, what do you fear? I, I wrote that because I was asked that question by an LP, uh, an LP prospect, an institutional allocator. And what I was referring to there was, you know, wh what do you fear in investing? And in VC, it's very common for there to be ideas that everybody gets at the same time. Sort of, you know, just something that's latent in the world that everybody realizes is an, op is an opportunity. Like, you know, when Leibniz and, uh, and Newton invest invented calculus simultaneously. Synchronicity, uh, right? That's what I think it's called. Synchronicity, exactly. And so, um, you know, a few years ago, that was VR content. And then it was influencer marketing. And... I try to think about, you know, there were crypto ideas out there. And in general, I am very skeptical of any investment where the thesis is that 20 other people have pitched me this idea and the 21st team that pitches me the idea is going to be better than all of them and will beat the other 20. And so I really fear competition when I am evaluating investments and I'm really looking for opportunities where a company will succeed or fail for some reason other than competition. And that takes me into really wild and woolly areas where software has typically not been a solution to an existing business problem in the past, but there is some reason to believe that that business problem can now be solved by software in a way that it could never have been before. Can you give an example of something like that? Yeah, I'll, uh, I have a uh, I have a portfolio company called Slingshot Aerospace that does computer vision analysis of aerial imagery, primarily imagery coming off of the giant fleet of micro satellites that now exist in the world. And up until five or six years ago you didn't have low-cost launch systems like SpaceX, and you didn't have low-cost imagery and radios and solar power and all these other components that were mostly developed for cell phones that would enable you to put a satellite in orbit that's the size of a loaf of bread that could take high-resolution images of anywhere on Earth. And now there's hundreds. There's literally hundreds of these satellites up there and they are taking so much imagery every day that if our government, the NSA or the National Geospatial Agency or anyone who does this kind of stuff wanted to actually analyze all of this imagery by hand with people, they would have to hire 100,000 people, 
literally 100,000 people to just sit in front of computer screens and look at images before and after every day and say, which of these has changed? And obviously no one's going to do that. But that's not a job that a person should do. That's a job that software should do. That's a job for machine learning and computer vision. And now that anyone can order up this imagery from all of these satellites, you don't have to be you know, the National Geospatial Agency to do that. It opens up all sorts of new use cases. You can assess damage after a natural disaster. You can look at real estate development trends. You can do all sorts of stuff. And Slingshot is building a platform to enable all of that. I recently learned that the uh, the early spy satellites took photos with film. And in order to uh, get the film back to Earth, you had to send a canister with, uh, with a parachute. Yep, and they the, dropped them. The Russians knew where they, roughly they were going to land, and so they used to send ships out to try and, and try and catch these things before the Americans could get them. But the Americans were able to get them with, uh, with planes that could fly through and catch them midair. So we've come a long way. Yes, it's, uh, it's quite the game of uh, capture the flag. And uh, <laughs> one of the interesting things there is that, you know, often one aspect of technology advances faster than others. And so right now there is more imaging capability in orbit than there is bandwidth. And so about 90% of the images that are taken um, by these satellites, by these microsatellites every day, aren't even beamed down to Earth because we don't have enough orbital bandwidth to handle all of that right now. And there's a bunch of startups that are working on different technical approaches to debottlenecking that particular issue. So how does it prioritize what it sends down? Who pays the most? <laughs> Fair enough. You also mentioned in the What Do You Fear blog post uh, commoditization. So let's talk about that a little bit. Right. So competition, I believe, you know, creates commoditization. And you have to really be worried about is your product and is your company enough of a company and enough of a product that you don't become a feature in somebody else's solution. And that's a really, really challenging thing. It's a really challenging thing to think about what it, that is so hard to do today that it's the basis of a new startup will still be the case like that and won't be something that will just be given away for free by Google or anybody in 10 years. What are some signposts in making that decision? Often it's, some kind of a customer lock-in, it's some kind of a network effect, it is some kind of dependency. Um, you know, if you can build an open architecture platform where other people can build useful products on top of your platform, that can often be a really good defense against commoditization. And ultimately, it really is, you just have to, you have to drive commoditization into other parts of the value chain, except for where you are, and you have to create more value for everybody in your value chain than you take yourself. Bill Gates was asked about this in the 1990s. Somebody did some math and calculated that of all the value that Windows created as an operating system, Microsoft was only capturing about 10% of that. And the PC OEMs were capturing a portion, the application developers were capturing a portion, the peripheral makers were capturing a portion and somebody said, you know, why don't you drive price? Bill, like, why don't you capture more of this? And what he said is, you know, we don't need to capture more of this. We need to just be growing the pie for everybody and that will be better for everybody if they do that. And that's why even today, 20 years later, 25 years after he was asked that question, Windows still generates tens of billions of dollars a year in operating profit. Yeah, and they cleverly switched to a software as a service. Uh, so now I get the $8, $9 fee every month and don't even notice it. Exactly. Rather than having the $350 or whatever it was, $800 once every four years. Yep. Uh, let's talk about the limitations of portfolio management because that was one that was particularly laden with uh, VC-specific jargon that I think is interesting to unpack for folks. So let's talk about pro rata rights. What are those? A pro rata right is the right to invest in the next round of a company proportional to your ownership in the company prior to the round. So if you own 5% of a uh, company and they raise another round, you have the right to 
put your own money in equal to 5% of that round. And that, you know, theoretically helps to maintain your ownership in the company. Now, your ownership will diminish anyways because of new stock options being issued and uh, a few other things. And so, you know, if you own 5% in a seed round, you're not going to own 5% by the Series D, even if you exercise your pro rider rights the whole way up. But you can still minimize your dilution as much as possible. And that right, which is a contractual right, is also a right that is also subject to negotiation. You know, it is very common for me to have pro rata rights in the deal I do, and then a big time, you know, Sand Hill Road firm comes along and says, we want to take the entire Series A because we have our own ownership requirements. Mm -hmm. And I know that, you know, you at Stage Venture Partners have pro rata rights, and that's adorable, and you're going to waive those rights because we're going to not come in the company if you don't allow us to do so. And in cases like that, I will probably have to do what is best for the company. So you talked about uh, you have a, a balancing between you the, the, the most return is probably going to be from that very early investment, but then you get to deploy more capital if you follow on. So how do you how do you make that decision? Yeah, I think it's the, the best way to make that decision is to be realistic with the fact that most companies take more than a year, often two or three years, to go from a seed check to a Series A. Most of the time, they're going to need more money, and the, the, more, the most likely place to look for more money is from their existing investors. At the same time, you know, I don't need to reserve money to invest in the C, D, and E rounds of my portfolio companies because at that point, the price per share will be so high and the dollar amounts required will be so high that you know, another $250,000 for me, the seed round investor, is not going to make a difference to them or to me. And so it doesn't make sense for me to hold back money to, to participate in a round like that. So there's a balancing act as to, you know, when a company is dependent on me and when my dollars make a difference, when I am still making investment decisions that are commensurate with my position in the ecosystem as a seed investor, and when it make t- when it when it makes sense to sort of bow out of future financing obligations at the company and let the next stage investors handle that. When you move from seed to A to B, C, D, so on. Are these, uh, is that just the number of rounds that you that the company has raised or is there some expectation that seed stage could be anything? Round A, you need to have revenue. Round B, you need to have whatever, profitability or whatever the, whatever the criteria may be. Yeah, um, the boundaries are fluid. They're ill-defined. They're different for different types of industries and they're ever-changing. And it drives startup founders totally bonkers to try to figure it out it's hard for even for us as vcs sometimes to figure out where those uh where those lines are moving and i wish there were a more concrete and defined way of uh drawing those distinctions but no one has figured it out yet right uh there seems the darkest start in private equity and venture capital is in the calculation of returns so you have uh there are two methods for doing a dpi and irr can you unpack those acronyms and tell us what they mean yeah so irr is the internal rate of return that is often you know measured uh for a venture firm it's very different from a compound annual growth rate that a public equity oriented fund will have because we don't call all of our capital at once i might raise a fund today and still be deploying into new startups three years from now and then still be doing follow-on investments two years after that. So I don't hold the cash today that I'll be investing five years from now. My investors have committed it to me, but I haven't called it down. So the timing of the cash flows impacts the IRR. Because of that, IRRs in venture and in private equity are always higher than any you know CAGR in a public equity portfolio, and you need to adjust for that and sort of have a mental model as to what kind of an IRR equi- you know, is equivalent to what kind of a CAGR. Uh, it's one of these things that, that makes VC and PE look a little bit more glamorous than it is uh, because the IRRs can be very eye-popping. I mean, I, I've seen IRR numbers for PE funds where they only made a multiple of capital of like 
50 or 60 percent, so 1.5x on DPI on the fund, but they had like a 30 percent IRR because they did a few investments and then exited or recapped those real quickly and sent cash back to their investors. You know, that's a that's an okay outcome. But ultimately, what matters is what is the multiple of capital that you send back to your investors? What is the DPI, the dollars paid out to invest in capital that uh, that you return? And in VC, in a seed venture fund, you've got to be sending back that if all fees and expenses more than three or three point five or four x in order to compensate for the crazy risk that any investor takes to invest in seed venture capital, and you know, really good rich, really good seed funds can return ten x or more. And so the distinction is, from the investor's perspective, they've committed a certain amount of capital to you, but you don't draw it all down at once, you draw down some portion of it. And so they have to have that commitment liquid and available. So they might have it in in cash or something equivalent, not earning a great return, but your return is only calculated on the portion that you draw down. That's correct. And that's why most investors like me raise money from institutions that have the internal capability to manage their cash flow commitment needs for capital calls in the future, or when we work with high net worth individuals and family offices, we either make sure that they have some kind of internal capability, whether they have a wealth manager or a financial planner or someone like that who knows how to do this kind of stuff, or we just call it all up front from investors like that who may not be as sophisticated and who don't want the hassle of sitting on and planning for capital calls in the future. So that, that's a that's a case where you're, you have to know your investors really well. You have to communicate very clearly with people and where you have to make sure that everybody is equipped to deal with the realities of the asset class. If you make an investment from one fund, is it possible for another fund to follow on? Uh, another one of your funds, so you have one, two, three, and so on? It, yeah, it's possible to do that. Uh, generally, that crosses into an area where there can be very serious concerns about governance because the investors in my fund two are not going to be the exact same group of investors in my fund three, let's say. There will be some overlap, but there will be new investors who come in. And there can be the perception that you are throwing good new money after bad old money to salvage a deal uh, when you're doing that. And so different firms have different guidelines for how they do that. I have always just said, you know what, it's really good to have bright, clear lines. And so I follow what I call the Ghostbusters rule. Don't cross the streams. So I don't cross the streams. I do not invest from all my fund two companies are a totally separate and distinct group of companies from my fund three companies, let's say. Uh, and I, I write the rules in black and white so that there can be a, no ambiguity there. I wondered about that. Is that is that what's the industry standard on that? Is it common or is that uncommon? It's a good question. I think most people who want to just keep things simple and clean, write the rules in such a way that is somewhat like mine. Um, but others may have LPs who have a degree of comfort with the ability of a firm to make those decisions and make those decisions on a case-by-case -case basis. Often it might go to the LPs through the Limited Partnership Advisory Committee, the LPAC, to let's say get a waiver or special permission to make an investment on that basis. And so th there, there are ways where it can be done that um, that ensure that proper governance and notification are are followed. Um, I just, when I was thinking about it, thought through it and said, you know, the, the the return on invested brain damage here would not be high enough to compel me to want to do that. And I went for simplicity. I've heard uh, in producing, in film producing in Los Angeles, often there's a, f a firm will have a number of projects on you might have a dozen projects working at various different stages and they'll have um, they'll raise for each individual project and then they'll have one of those projects you know they're often very difficult to see which one will be popular not that any in film investors ever make any money at all but one of them might win an oscar and then people will be upset about the fact that they weren't in the one that won the oscar so that approach deal by deal financing is also something you can do in startups you can do individual special purpose vehicles. There are online platforms like AngelList that make that very easy and straightforward to do now. Um, it 
again has the issue of are you in the right deal at that right at the right time and how are you making a long enough commitment and uh, you know it, it, it's it has benefits and drawbacks associated with it just like investing in a fund would um, and you know it's funny that you mentioned film finance because film finance is obviously a big business here in LA and it's probably the only type of investing that makes what I do look like beauty bonds. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I think that there's there's an expectation of return in seed stage, whereas I don't think there's much expectation in film financing. Yeah, it's uh, boy. I think it all gets spent along the way. That sure seems to be like the hardest way to make an easy living imaginable. Uh, what in your portfolio are you particularly excited about? Do you have in terms of rather than returns, in terms of um, changing the world or making the future more interesting and bright? <laughs> I, mean, I, have a, I have a number of portfolio companies that are doing really interesting, really unusual work. You know, I have a company called Verisim Life that builds biosimulation models of the way that drugs are absorbed, metabolized, distributed, and excreted in the bodies of uh, over two dozen um, animal species. And right now, that technology is being used by some pretty big pharmaceutical companies. In fact, they just published their research with Genentech a few days ago, so I'm, I'm now allowed to uh, to name Genentech as one of their early partners and customers, which I have not been able to do up until now. Um, but Genentech is using Verisim's software to make much higher resolution decisions about which of their drug candidates should go into animal testing, and then eventually, as the software gets better and better, we're going to be able to skip that step. We will not need to do animal testing to get drugs to human testing at some point in the future. The reason that's possible is because when you test a drug in an animal, you are not doing so in order to tell does the drug work or not. That's what human testing is for. Animal testing is all about toxicity. Right. And then the the first... the. I mean, I'm, I'm aware that they test in humans as well for, uh, they're just testing to see how long it takes you to break it down and for it to exit your body, right? There's, that's, that's something that a lot of university students used to do when I was, when I was at college. Yeah. So, uh, so is that, is that how you paid for college? <laughs> that's not, that's not how I paid for it. I was <laughs> very fortunate to be in Australia with a different system, but, uh, there are a lot of people who did that. Uh, a lot of medical students did that. Okay. Yeah. It's, uh, in, it, well, so you know, enrolling patients, enrolling human patients in testing is another very large uh, problem in drug development. And I have a portfolio company. <coughs> pardon me. I have a portfolio company that is working on that as well. That one is much earlier stage, and so I can't talk about that one as much as I can talk about Verison. But you know, both of those companies are examples of the kinds of things that I like to invest in. There's almost no software companies that are doing this kind of thing. It's a new area for software to go into and the impact is going to be very large. And so what else have you got in the, uh, in the portfolio? Let's see, what else do I have? Uh, I have, uh, the biggest area that I invest in is software companies that are building the tools the arms, really, the weapons that are necessary to compete for survival against Amazon. Mm -hmm. You know, Amazon invests so heavily in the e-commerce experience that if you were not matching them, if you're not matching them tool for tool and product for product, you will lose. So I have companies that do everything from enable same-day shipping for any e-commerce merchant to enabling lifetime value analysis with a degree of precision that has never been possible before to tracking counterfeiters and rogue sellers, all sorts of stuff in e-commerce. Does Amazon track counterfeiters? Because I get the impression that Amazon sells a lot of uh, counterfeit goods. They sure don't seem to care. I think that the shopping experience there has certainly deteriorated. I think if you go through, I would say that we often buy things that, are, uh, that, that aren't the real thing. It's very hard to tell. Amazon... Amazon has made a bunch of interesting choices as they've grown. Um, putting ads on the search feed, you know, generates 90% gross margins for them. It's an incredibly lucrative product. 
but it fundamentally it fundamentally draws into question the promise that they're making to their customers of presenting them the best and the right product for their search and making it easy for them to find what they need. Um, and the ad product really, I think, marked a, a line in the sand where Amazon said, we're, we're really not as committed to our customers as we have been in the past. We're gonna look to monetize in ways that uh, are not directly serving the interests of our customers. And a lot of the decisions that they have made subsequent to that decision continue in that, in that vein. And I think that as strong as Amazon is, the company is now old enough and large enough that there are very large gaps where they're not paying attention and where they are um, either they're not paying attention or they're squeezing too hard on their customers or their suppliers or their partners that is going to create opportunities for other people to come in and create value. And uh, it's going to be really interesting to watch the business strategy of all of that. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. We've seen that on a micro example in my family where we often go to Walmart or Target uh, because we at least know that the goods are going to that come from those stores are going to be the real thing rather than, you know, because yeah. those little kids don't want to give them the counterfeit stuff. Exactly. Exactly. So, yeah, it's uh, there's going to be a lot of opportunities there. And because Amazon spends so heavily and because the choice of matching them is an existential one for their competitors, there's a giant tailwind to adoption for any kind of e-commerce tool. All the companies that are in e-commerce know that they have to be trying everything. They have to be on the forefront. They have to be giving the customers the most compelling experience with them possible or they will die and so it's a great it's a great business to be an arms dealer in yeah so retail is notoriously tough but if you're in the picks and shovels to retail you think that's a slightly better space than being the directly facing the customer that's correct and so to be clear i am not investing in any digitally native vertical brands i am not investing in you know anyone trying to sell paper clips on a shopify store um, that, that's not uh, what I'm in the business of, but anyone who would like to sell, you know, paper clips on their own Shopify store will need all sorts of tools available in order to th for them to make money selling paper clips online. And my portfolio companies stand ready, willing, and able to supply them with everything they need to be successful in the paper clip business. So is that is that sold in parallel with Shopify, or is that is that something that competes with Shopify? Yeah, I mean, Sh Shopify's e-commerce storefront technology integrates with all of the other tools that my companies offer. Uh, Shopify has a pretty um, robust API layer uh, available with it that allows us to exchange data with Shopify at all times. But at the same time, Shopify cannot solve every problem for every need that their that their customers, their their um, merchants have, and so there are there are opportunities for us to build products uh, that Shopify would not. Uh, one of the interesting uh, companies that I saw on your site was Placer AI. Uh, what what do they do, and what, what's the uh, what's the opportunity there? So Placer collects data in a passive and anonymous way from uh, cell phones. They collect location data, and so. You know, when, when we think about location data, people often think about things like invasion of privacy and stuff like that. But where you know you, Toby, or I, Alex, are at any given time does not have any business value for real estate or advertising or anything like that. You know, you don't spend enough money. I presume I don't spend enough money for anyone to care where you or I are. But where all of us are in aggregate is immensely valuable. And so Placer has location data that they have gotten from their partners, mostly mobile app makers, about where a large number of people are. The, they don't care about real-time data. Uh, that has Real-time has no value um, on an aggregate basis, um, but they do care about patterns. And so Placer has a, an anonymous map-based interface that will show people where traf foot traffic patterns are growing, where they're declining, 
and it can be used for all sorts of applications. You can use it for um, lease negotiations for commercial real estate. You can use it to analyze things like store cannibalization. So if you want to open a new Buffalo Wild Wings, for example, and there are, are already three other Buffalo Wild Wings in the region, you can look at five different locations that you could have as possible sites for the new store and determine which one will draw in the most new customers, will cannibalize the least, and will be close demographically to the type of customer that you want to reach. That is a kind of data that has never been available before for owners, lessors, brokers, and others um, involved in the commercial real estate market. And Placer is uh, growing tremendously and is uh, doing a lot of really interesting stuff in that regard. Uh, that's absolutely fascinating. Uh, we're coming up on time, Alex. So if folks want to get in contact with you, what's the best way of doing that? The best way is to uh, anyone who is interested in pitching or sending a deck or something like that can just email me, alex at stagevp.com. And uh, anyone who wants to just see what uh, Stage is up to and the kinds of things we do uh, can follow me on Twitter at uh, alexrubelkava.com or sorry, at Alex Rubelkava on Twitter. And then uh, the firm also has a uh, has a Twitter page at Stage VP. That's great. I'll make sure all of those are in the uh, in the in the notes to the podcast. Uh, Alex Rubelkava, Stage VP. Thank you very much. Thanks, Toby.